Hello and welcome to week two, part two. And today we are going to talk about the essential toolkit that you need as a programmer, as a coder. And my cats are going crazy, so uh, there are going to be noises in the background. Um, today we're going to discuss some things that uh, are essential for you as a programmer to know and um, for you to be able to work with before you even start coding. Um, now, over the course of the development of computers and especially developing computers for the everyday person, people have wanted to make them more intuitive, easier to use, and make sure that no matter your uh, previous experience, you can understand what to do and how to operate a computer. Um, when computers and PCs started becoming um, common in or more common in households, um, but not so essential that everyone had a computer, they were not as intuitive, not as easy to navigate and to work with. And that enabled those people who started off and, and uh, had a, a PC or a, a Mac to resort to problem solve and really understand and dig into behind the scenes. Uh, of the computer. So today you have um, Windows settings or applications in Mac and it's very visualized and you don't really need to go into uh, a lot of complicated menus, you don't need to go into, um, you don't need to use your uh, command line interface, you don't need to um, pull up the big black box and start typing text to use your computer if you're an, just a everyday user. And you did need to do that back when computers just started being available to the general public at home. So since they're so intuitive and easy to use and, and easy to understand, manufacturers have sort of hidden all of the ways where you can start poking around in your computer. They've made... Um, it's so good that you don't need to go into those areas of your computer to problem solve. Now, this is great for everyday people, and it's not so great if you start out wanting to be a programmer and you don't have that experience. If you had that experience um, from when computers, uh, when you needed to, for example, know how to format your uh, your computer or reinstall the operating system and if you had those experiences where something went wrong and you needed to just delete everything and install Windows again for example um, then you've had that experience and you know where to poke you know how the computer is structured and you know sort of um, what to look for if something goes wrong so today things don't go wrong as much so you might not have the experience of needing to find out what the problem is. So since we don't have that experience, we sort of need to um, learn that manually. We need to make an effort to understand the underlying structures of the computer since we don't have, um, uh, we don't, we never had to go in and uh, look at these underlying structures and these underlying um, these underlying settings that you might need to check um, if you had a computer from way back in the day. So that is what we're going to do today. So this might be uh, one of the, if not the most important video and lesson of this entire course, because the programming, the coding, all of that, that can come later when you um, start, uh, start, start at school, start learning about uh, those structures, coding, and how to write logic and what that is. And these things are really necessary to even be able to set up that, to even navigate that and use that. This is foundational knowledge that you need as a programmer, but it isn't something that's taught when they start teaching programming. Um, it's not so much that people don't think it's valuable it's that either they assume that you already have this knowledge because they grew up with that knowledge they grew up with those experiences 
or it's something that you're expected to pick up along the way. Now, when you're starting out and you want to learn coding, having all of these things that you need to additionally learn, it's just new knowledge with new knowledge with new knowledge and it becomes confusing, frustrating and difficult to understand how it all gets put together. So by trying to uh, give you um, foundation now, um, we're hoping that we can, when you do start coding, um, have that knowledge be put on top of this so you already have this baseline to, to start from. So you don't need to learn too many things at once and so that you don't need to focus both on learning to code and all of these uh, concepts that we're going to be discussing today uh, at once. So that's what we're going to, going to discuss in this video. So we're going to go through something that called the terminal and the shell. We're going to go through file systems, folders and files on your computer. And then lastly, we're going to go through something called version control. So uh, let's jump into the coders toolkit. The concepts that we're going to talk about today, they aren't really related to each other. They are just put in the same uh, module or the same video for you to learn because they're all on the same level of importance um, for you to uh, know and learn about in order to start coding. Um, they're all also things that people tend to struggle with when they start coding, even before they've written a single line of code. So these topics are going to help you have a baseline knowledge and have the tools you need to even start coding. So let's start with the terminal and the shell. Let's start by uh, learning about the terminal and the shell. So if you ever seen a movie where a hacker is sitting at a computer and it's just a black screen with a bunch of text, then you've seen sort of what a terminal looks like. But before we dive into how a terminal works and what you do with it, you need to understand how your computer's files and folders are organized. You see, you have a um, tree structure uh, when it comes to your files and folders. Um, all of your folders, your files are organized in a way that you have one container, one folder, that then branches out like a tree into other folders and the structure goes deeper and deeper and deeper. So this is different depending on which operating system you're using. If you're using Windows, uh, usually the, um, the root folder, the one at the very top that contains all the other, other folders, uh, starts with the letter. Uh, for example, C is very common, so it's C colon. And for uh, Mac and Mac OS, it's a backslash. So this one root folder contains every other folder um, in your file system. When you're using your computer normally every day, day to day, you probably use a mouse and you double click on a folder to open it and then you double click on a file to open that. Um, so when you uh, turn on your computer, it starts up, you arrive at the desktop and then it's waiting for you to do something. So if you think about this uh, structure of folders that we talked about, what you don't see as the user, but what's actually happening is that you have a position within this um, tree-like structure. Um, when you start your computer and you arrive at your desktop, you are standing in your desktop folder. So depending on where you, uh, whatever you open, you actually navigate uh, your computer's folder structure and move along this tree-like structure. So if you have your um, root folder up here and then you have additional folders going down, when you start your computer, you are standing in your desktop down here. When you click on, um, double click on a folder inside of you that, that's positioned on your desktop, what you're doing is you're moving yourself into that new folder. 
and when you exit it, uh, you click on the big X or the big red button that exits that folder, you move back into your desktop. So you're constantly, uh, by opening folders, uh, navigating in this tree-like structure. It's just that you can see that you have a position because it's being visualized. Um, your position is being visualized to you uh, by the UI and you don't have a clear indicator that actually you are in C slash blah, 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 desktop. But that's the reality. That is how um, navigating and opening folders and closing folders actually works behind the scenes. When you're using the terminal, you are uh, doing the same thing that you do when you move your mouse and double click and open files or when you right click and you create a new folder. You can use your entire computer using the terminal and using text commands. Um, you type in a command to move into a folder and that is the same thing as you double clicking a folder and being able to um, access the files inside of that folder. The difference is that one is you moving, double clicking, and one is you typing in the command, clicking enter, and then the computer executes whatever you want it to do. Now, why is this even necessary? Well, when you have text commands, it enables you to save those text commands and put them into a, a bundle. And you can say to the computer to, hey, please execute all of these text commands at once, for example. And if you um, need to create a folder and then create a file and you want that to happen automatically, having a terminal and something that can run there enables you to um, run that code. And then you tell the computer to right click, create a new folder, in that folder, create a new file, uh, name it this, um, type in this text into this um, text uh, file. Um, but you can't code that with the movements you do with your mouse. So when you use the terminal, you can um, save those commands and save those actions. And you can't do that if you're uh, using the UI and using your mouse and keep um, mouse to move around. The terminal itself is the window that you see uh, with the with the black box. Um, you open it up, and like I said, you the first line of text in your terminal is um, your position within this tree-like structure. Um, so the the terminal is really the visual UI for navigating your and and um, using your computer this way. And what's executing, that's a cat, I promise. Uh, what's executing those is the shell. Yeah. The shell is what, what runs the, the commands you type in. And the terminal is just the UI that allows you to talk to the shell. So you can do the same things that you do on your computer normally, but in the terminal, you type in commands and you get usually feedback back. And then the shell executes your com commands. So if you, um, folders, when you talk about folders in, when you start programming, uh, are sometimes called directories. And so a command to create a folder in your terminal might be, uh, mk um, space dir so that stands for make directory so you type in make directory into the terminal it provides a space for you to write that and then the shell is the thing that actually creates the directory the folder and that is the exact same action as you right clicking and uh, clicking on new folder if you're on your desktop and you right click and you make a new folder, that folder is going to um, be positioned, you're going to see it visually on your desktop. Um, the same thing happens uh, when you've navigated in your tree-like structure in the terminal, 
by moving up and down this uh, this this hierarchy. So you, when you type in mk di make directory, you create a new folder in the directory that you are currently positioned in. The reason why this is so important also to understand this tree-like structure, this hierarchy, is that when you're programming, you might be referencing other files, you might be um, using other files, you, you need to um, know where they are and you need to ask your computer to, hey, can you please go to this location and give me the contents of this file. And since you can't encode, you can't write the action of right clicking, you need to be able to know how to uh, provide this information with text. So if you want to include a picture and you've saved it in a folder structure, you might need, you need to write the, the path uh, the location of that picture and tell that to your computer so that your computer can go there and get that picture for you. And this happens all the time when you code. You need to reference other things and if you don't understand this tree-like structure, how it works, how to navigate it and that it even exists and that you're standing in a directory or that you have a position as a user within this tree-like structure, it's going to be really difficult to, to, to work with. So this may sound like really basic information, really basic knowledge, but it is still confusing when you're working with it because you might not intuitively understand that you have this position and that you can navigate. Um, and knowing how to navigate that is, is really something that you're going to be doing every day, and especially in the terminal. Now, the issue here a little bit is that with a visual UI, you have an overview of everything. As soon as you do something, you see it straight away and you get a visual um, um, a visual general view of what's happening and what's going on. If you have a, if you're standing in your desktop, if you have three folders, you immediately see those three, three folders. When you're in the terminal, it doesn't work that way. So you might be standing in your desktop, but you need to tell the terminal to show you the contents of your desktop. It doesn't do this automatically. So since you don't have an overview and you need to tell the computer to show you what's in the folder you're standing in, um, navigating this tree-like structure becomes a little bit of a challenge because of our short-term memory. Um, you can't visualize it, so you need to constantly see what's here. And then when you want to move up or down this tree-like structure, Using a mouse uh, and double clicking is as simple as opening a folder and you can maybe sometimes still see the desktop behind you and see what's, what's there while you're standing in another folder. And then you just click it down and you close that folder and now you're standing in your desktop. But in the terminal, um, these actions aren't as visually outlined and visually presented to you. So when you're standing in your desktop, you have no idea what's in it until you ask the computer, hey, what's here? One second, my cat is going crazy. And then you need to type in a command to move up that structure. It, when you have the desktop open, you're in another folder, you, you still see the desktop and the contents of the desktop. But when you're in the terminal and you move up that uh, within that tree-like structure, the computer still won't show you what's there until you ask it, hey, can you list everything that's in this specific folder? And you also then don't know, without asking it what's there, you don't know where you could go. So say that you navigate towards your downloads and there you have um, eight folders. Just by navigating there, you have no idea what exists. Um, and you also don't maybe know, don't know what's um, in your hierarchy above downloads. And moving up and down this, you might forget or not um, 
see the, the, the tree-like structure visually in front of you. So the challenge in using the terminal isn't so much that it's uh, complicated and difficult, it's that um, you don't get the same overview and you need to create a mental map of what exists um, instead of the operating system visualizing that for you. So now we know a little bit what the terminal uh, works like and how it, it feels like to sit and, and move around in it and, and navigate it. So if we go on then to the shell. The shell is sort of the intermediary between the terminal and the operating system. The terminal is really just the UI that you use to type in your commands and get feedback. But the shell is the thing that um, executes them. It talks to the operating system um, and, a lot, and is what uh, enables your commands to be executed, to be run. So that is what m creates a folder, for example. So people will be using the, the terms terminal and shell very interchangeably. They might mean the terminal, but they might say shell and vice versa. So when you uh, look around and you start learning about programming and, and, and um, working at these sort of tools, uh, when people use them interchangeably, it gets confusing what does what, what is what, uh, because of course there are choices in both terminal and shell. Um, and by having this distinction of what is the UI and what is the thing that executes the, the commands uh, could be helpful for you to understand so that when somebody says shell, you know that they might mean terminal if they're talking about the window for ex uh, where you type in your commands, for example. Now, different operating systems um, need different shells to uh, communicate with them, and they're going to have different um, terminals, different UI to communicate with. Get a Sphinx cap, they said. It will be fun, they said. She's ruining my setup. <laughs> Mac OS has uh, the terminal. Um, as its default um, default terminal, <laughs> um, whereas Windows comes with something called Command Prompt, uh, as well as something called PowerShell. So these are all of them uh, are terminals that have an associated shell with them, uh, but they work a little uh, different, and there's a little bit of uh, backstory and history to why that is that you could benefit from knowing, so I'm going to go through it a little bit. Now, if you've watched uh, the video that uh, talks about operating systems, you might be familiar with uh, Unix. It's one of the, it was a pioneering operating system that was invented in the 70s, and a lot of its ideas um, and, uh, for example, the tree-like structure um, is still sort of a standard today. and it's still been updated, modernized, so people don't really use Unix, um, pure Unix anymore. But all of the ideas and the way to interact with the software has sort of developed in, in one direction here to Linux and uh, Mac OS. Linux being an open source um, operating system and Mac OS being for Mac computers. And then we have Windows over here that uh, certainly took ideas and inspiration from uh, Unix, but didn't. Well, it's not really related to um, Unix the same way that Linux and Mac OS is over here. So Unix over here had specific um, commands that, it, that you would need to type to interact uh, with the operating system. And back then you needed to use a terminal. So, for example, you would use the word the the command cd, and then the name of a uh, directory to change directory cd, and because its close relationships uh, be because of the close relationship between Unix and Linux and Mac OS, the commands that were used for Unix have sort of just been trickled down and they're the same for Linux and Mac OS. As Windows wasn't as closely related, took the ideas of Unix, but wasn't really um, 
um, if didn't really evolve from it, they have different commands. So sitting at a terminal in Windows and sitting at a terminal in... Sorry about my cat. <laughs> so anyway, um, so because you have two different origins, so to speak, you have different commands that you use in the terminal. And you have different applications as well. So um, in Windows, you have the command prompt that uses, that is the terminal and you have a, another, um, and you have a shell attached to it. But then you also have PowerShell, which is a terminal and a shell in one. And PowerShell is a lot more powerful and has a lot more functionality and can do a lot more than um, just command prompt in Windows. So when you want to do um, uh, these commands that can be saved and you can ask the computer, hey, can you create a folder and a file, etc., etc. When you have two operating systems that are so different that they even use different commands, it's not really, if you then write everything in with Windows commands, then nothing on Mac uh, or Linux can run because they're two different commands. It won't know what to do. And similarly, uh, the other way around. Um, so to work around this problem, people have developed a terminal uh, shell that uh, can work with both. So you, uh, you can install this terminal shell um, on both Mac and Linux and Windows, and you can use the same commands uh, on both. So it's sort of like a bridge that allows me to sit with a Windows computer and you to sit with a Mac computer. And we'll both, if I type in commands in this terminal, um, it's going to act the same way if you have the same terminal. Starting with the origin story, once again, uh, much as we had Unix as the um, pioneer within operating systems and how they work today, we had a terminal and shell that also was a uh, pioneer and kind of what everything evolved from, which is called Bash. So you would use the terminal Bash on Unix. And over time, when people realized that they needed to bridge this gap between different operating systems and the commands that you use and how they work, they developed Git Bash. Git Bash is a um, terminal shell that you can download for both Windows and for Linux and for Mac OS, and it will work the same way. Now, since Git Bash, Bash, since it's evolved from Bash, you use the same commands in Git Bash as you do on Linux and Mac OS. But that allows developers to bridge the gap and have uh, this common um, way of communicating uh, with the terminal and a way to um, work with the same tools and know the same commands and be able to share code and it's going to work uh, on everyone's uh, setup. Uh, Git Bash is what you're probably going to be working with as your terminal. So um, that's why we're talking about it a little bit more in depth. There are more um, options out there. Uh, but another reason it's so powerful, not just because it bridges the gap, is also because it uh, has integrated something called version control that we're going to talk about later. But just know that when you uh, type commands into Git Bash, you are going to use the same commands as you would in Linux and Mac. And now we're going to switch gear and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, files and folders or directories. So what is a file? A file is a collection of data that you can use to save information. And file come, files come in different formats. You have JPEG and PNG for images. You have MP4 and .avi for uh, video, TXT, DOCX uh, for, for um, Word documents. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on and on. Um, you, you have .exe for running a program, right? So that is uh, what a file is. And then what is a folder? 
a folder is just a way of uh, organizing other folders and files. Uh, a folder is a location within this tree-like structure. All computers um, need to have a file system. Um, so the file system, what it does, it has rules and regulations for how it's going to handle files and folders, store it, retrieve it, um, and manage these uh, files and folders. And uh, it also has some additional jobs. Besides providing the hierarchical, hierarchical, whichever, uh, tree-like structure, it also helps you manage permissions. Now, permissions is uh, another one of those Unix uh, ideas that um, was a good one that they kept and has been integrated into uh, other operating systems and their file uh, systems. So what it is, is that um, depending on what, you, uh, what permissions you have, you can do different things with files and folders. So for example, if I am a user on a computer, I might have a specific set of permissions. Uh, I might be allowed to open a file and read it, but I might not be uh, allowed to um, change it and save it in a new, in a new state. Um, when I try, the computer is going to say, no, you don't have permission to do this. Uh, and the reason this is, is so that we don't access uh, files that we're not supposed to and don't mess with things that could ruin or damage the uh, system itself. And if you have a large corporation or a large organization and you have lots of people using um, the same system, uh, having, if everyone has access to uh, everything, it's very easy to make a mistake and accidentally delete the operating system and make everyone's computer just not run. So you would have somebody that would be in charge of this, which would be the administrator. So they would have the permission to do anything and everything. Uh, look at um, everyone's files or uh, delete or create things that other people might not. And the reason for this is that they were, that's their job. Their, their job is to make sure that the system works and that people can't accidentally or intentionally maliciously uh, remove or add things um, and that the people who access data are allowed to access that data and that it there that it's not secret and an administrator your entire job is to just make sure that all of these permissions and these potential accidents don't happen so they have permission to do anything and everything uh, but me as a user, if I don't know the system and I see a file and I think, ah, oh, that's just junk and I delete it, then I can make, a, a, create a lot of headaches for a lot of people. So permissions is something that uh, was kept and something that is um, very important to know about, very important um, to understand uh, when you're programming. Um, files don't just have the type and the content of the file, the data itself. It also, there's also metadata that's, that gives you information about the file itself. So one type of metadata could be how big it is, or it could be um, when it was created. So it's information about the file itself. Now this could be very useful if you're looking for a file of a specific size. Uh, then you might need to know that you can actually check that. I'm sure you, you know that you can specifically check size, but just know that there are more, there's more information about files uh, in the metadata that could be useful and that could be um, important to know that it exists and that you can check it out. When talking about the file system, uh, we need to understand that it decides how things are saved and uh, fetched, meaning retrieved from uh, your hard drive, from the storage that you have there. And that that is what uh, keeps this and decides this uh, hierarchical tree-like structure. Um, this file system manages and makes sure that all of those pieces work and decides how that's going to be organized. And then continuing on with that, then you need to know that uh, since it decides what it's going to be organized, organized like this structure of one root folder and then 
folders under that folder under that folder ad infinitum then you also under, then you, then you arrive at what a path is so the path is um, all of the these locations these folders one after the other until you arrive at the specific folder or file that you are looking for that you want to go to so the path is if you're a windows user um, if you go from the very top the very basic top um, container that has all the other containers in it you start with the c and then slash and then you have the next directory or folder and then slash and then you have the next directory or folder and then you have the slash etc etc until you arrive at desktop for example so the path here is that entire line uh, of folders going from the top down to where you want to go or where you're looking for something that is the path now you type in this path in a terminal for example um, and uh, to to go to um, navigate to that so the path is really um, a way to understand where you are in the in the in the tree like structure but also a way for you to tell the computer to go there and get you something or thinking even one step ahead if there's a file in that folder it's a way for you to tell the computer using text hey please open this file for me so the way you do that is by typing in the entire path and then at the end typing in the name of the file with the extension of the file so what that enables you to do is that opens or accesses the file and the data in that file. So not only do you type the, the roadmap toward the file, when you also specify the file, it runs that. So if it's a text file, you open the text file and you can view the contents and maybe edit it, depending on, you know. Uh, if it's an image, the same thing, you can open it and view it. But if it's, um, uh, a program uh, a .exe it runs that program so you do two things at once right you specify the location of a file and you tell the uh, the computer to um, start up or run that file as well now we've discussed how you navigate this or how you type in a file path from the very root from the very top and you can do that from wherever you are in your um, tree-like structure. If you're on your desktop, but you specify a file from the top over here, C, you can specify any location in this tree-like structure, no matter where you're standing. That is the absolute path. No matter where you are, you tell the computer where to go, and because you start at the top, it knows exactly where to go. But there is also something called a relative path. Now, Remember, you're standing in a directory. You have a location in this tree-like uh, structure. I don't know how many times I've said this in this video, but you need to really understand that. Um, so when you're standing in this tree-like structure, if you use a relative path, you are not uh, specifying from the top down. You are telling the computer where to go relative to where from where you are. So you can tell the computer, hey, go one step up this tree-like structure and then go into another folder above me and then go down into the folder below and the folder below. So instead of going up here and you just have a straight path, if you're standing over here, uh, you can tell the computer to, hey, go up one level and then go into this folder and then go down two levels here. So standing from here you tell it where to go from relative your position and that is the relative path and that of course then looks different than c colon slash blah blah, blah slash whatever comes next uh, that is going to use a different way of communicating to the computer of how to get to that location now no matter if you use the relative or the absolute path it's still going to have the same effect in the sense of if you go to a folder, you're going to be standing in that folder. Or if you specify a file in there or a program, it's going to access that data or run that program. But it, it, it has to do with how you uh, explain the path to the computer. 
We've talked a little bit about um, accessing or, <coughs> excuse me, starting files when you specify the file at the end of your location. And that's a truth with a modification. Um, usually when you specify certain types of files, most types of files, you get to view the contents, but you don't actually get to access them in order to edit them and save them. Um, you need to usually add a keyword, um, a specific um, phrase, either in front or behind, depending on the, the specifics of the terminal and the spe specifics of you, what you want to do. So you need to add on that, hey, I don't just want to look at this file, I want to go into it as well and do something with it. And that is true for most files that you specify when you specify a file path, except for programs. .exes, you don't need to do anything um, additionally to uh, ask the computer to run a .exe. There, you only specify the path and at the end, the .exe, and um, telling the computer to go to that uh, folder and here is the program is going to automatically run it. So just be aware that a, a um, text file, you need to specify that you're going to open and edit, and otherwise you're just gonna view the contents. But for programs, you always run them if you just tell the computer to go there. So with these files, you can do some things. You can uh, view or read a file, meaning that you can look at its contents and then go out of the file and uh, it's going to be saved and um, it's going to remain the same as when you looked at it. That is a read operation on a file. You can do a um, write. And what this really comes from is that when you save something to your hard drive, you write it to disk. That is because uh, traditional um, hard disk drives would use these mechanical ways of, of encoding your long-term term storage by writing something on a spinning disk. Um, so that's why we use the term write to file or write to, to disk. But write essentially means that you um, edit whatever file you, you um, access and save, it, uh, save your new edit. That is writing to a file, so you change it somehow. Um, then you have uh, delete, which I hope I don't need to explain. Deleting a file completely from your memory. So these are file operations that we can do. And here is also where the permissions that we spoke about earlier come in. And also thinking about .exes, like we said, we just specified the, the path. Those you then execute. You ask the computer, hey, please start and run this program. And that is another file operation. Of course, you can't execute a text file. You can only read it or write to it. Um, but these four, read, write, execute, delete, are the basic file operations that, that you can do. And the permissions come in here because sometimes you might be allowed to read a file but not write to a file. Or you might be able to read and write but you won't, you won't be allowed to delete it. And again, this is to make sure that uh, people don't accidentally do stuff that they shouldn't do so that the system um, crashes or that the system can't function anymore. So the computer can have safeguards against you even going into certain uh, system files and deleting it because it's going to say, hey, if you, if you delete this file, you realize that your computer is going to crash, right? You, you don't want that. So it's going to tell you no or are you sure you want to do this, etc., etc. And uh, these permissions um, allow us to have multiple users on the same system and it allows us to have uh, an extra safeguard before we might um, do something that might um, give us migraines and uh, cause a lot of stress. Um, and these permissions are can be specific for specific users and specific for specific file type operations. We've already touched on this briefly, but just to follow the text, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, permissions and uh, ro user roles and uh, privileges. So this is who is um, an owner 
of a file and that is usually the person who creates a file and you have uh, permission to delete, uh, read that file, uh, update it, change it however you want. And these uh, permissions and these roles are to ensure that uh, we don't accidentally or intentionally um, change or delete other people's files, read stuff we shouldn't uh, be able to read, and delete things that might cause issues with the whole system. So you can have different permissions depending uh, to read, write, execute, or uh, delete a file depending on your role, which we've also already touched on. If you're a user, you usually have a permission to read, write, delete uh, your own files. But an admin might have the permission to read, write, delete um, files on a higher level and that are more um, necessary or essential for the system, the op operating system to run itself. And privileges is uh, the term used for what you're allowed to do with your files. Depending on your role, you can have um, access to a file, but you might not be able to delete that file, for example. Moving on to the last of these essential concepts that you need to know and understand to start coding, and that is something called version control. Now this is something completely different than what we've talked uh, about before. The terminal and files and folders and all of that is sort of related because you use the terminal to access folders and um, create and read files and so on and so forth. Version control is something completely separate from that really. So version control is a way for uh, programmers to save and store our work. Now, if you would want to um, relate to something you've probably used before, so think of a word processor and when you go to save your work, um, you, you tend to save over your file or you give your file a new name so that you have a new version of that file um, so that you have a copy of the new updated version and a copy of the version that existed when you started working. Well, that is how you use it, how you save files and save your work in a traditional word processor. With version control, what you can do is that you can store, you can save your work and you will have access to every single save consecutively, um, no matter what. Um, you uh, start off somewhere, you save your, your first work, and each time you save, you have the the uh, possibility of going back and reverting to an old version of the stuff you've saved. So why is this useful? It's very useful for um, the purpose of if you write something and it doesn't work and you've saved that, you can go back and you can uh, go back to a version that did work. You don't need to um, Control Z all the way through and rely on your internal uh, memory on how many uh, going back you can. But another reason it's uh, very useful is that you can also compare uh, your updated version that might not work and an old version. So if you only have one line of code that is the new version, then you can easily conclude that if it used to work in this state and this new state is just one extra line of code and that doesn't work, well, probably that line of code is where your error might be. So by being able to compare your uh, old work and your new work side by side, you have the document with all of your code here and the new document with all of your code here, you can easily see every single change that you've done just by scrolling and looking it through. One of the most uh, common programs or common um, applications for version control is called Git. So Git is something that you need to install on your computer. And then when you um, start your code, you can, in your, in your folder where your code's going to uh, be stored in, you can um, initialize or start up Git. 
Um, so what happens is that you start up um, um, Git and it's just for that specific folder. So if you have three projects, you initialize or um, put Git into each separate project uh, and all of them is going to have uh, Git in them. So what this allows you to do is that if you work on three projects and you save your changes the same way you would do in a word processor, um, the Git, um, it's a folder that um, is hidden within your project. That is going to store all of the different versions uh, of your stored work. And if you have three separate projects with three separate Gits, each little Git folder that's hidden in each project, it's going to save that project's work. Um, so you install it on, on your computer and you initialize it when you start a project. And then you have access to all the functionality, such as saving all of your work um, in your project. But Git allows us to do much more than that. It also allows us to see um, when the changes were made. Uh, it allows you to see a lot of information about the changes, not just store the changes uh, themselves. Now, when you install Git on your computer, um, you have it locally. So that means that Git is on your computer and you can always access your history, uh, all of the saved versions of your uh, work locally on your computer. But luckily we have something called the cloud now where you can um, upload your Git and your project online. So that means that you in initialize Git or start Git on your computer locally, and then you can uh, put that Git and put your project uh, on a, a cloud service that is going to store every single change, every single uh, version of your work, all the information about it online. So why is this useful? Well, imagine you've been working for two weeks on code and you have Git and you have the functionality to go back and everything. And then your computer crashes. So then all of that work is still lost. But by uploading it to the cloud service, um, your computer can die and crash and you get a new computer and you can just download your project um, from the latest version that you saved. It also allows us to share our code and to collaborate on code. Um, if you have it uh, somewhere um, on a cloud provider, other people that you grant access to can also download your code and collaborate with you and work on the same project at the same time. So try to think of it this way. If you are working in a Google Doc um, with other people, you're all in the same document and you're making changes at the same time and you can collaborate on one document uh, at the same time. Um, however, when you're working in a Google Doc, if you type a sentence, somebody else can just come and write over uh, and change what you've already done. What Git allows us to do is to save versions of our work that isn't going to be in conflict with other versions of our work. So what does that mean? If I saved something and then uh, you go and save a new version of that project, if you change something that I just changed, Git might be uh, saying, hey, hold up, wait a minute, this is a conflict. If we work on the same code and we upload it and save it, um, it's not going to know which version necessarily to store. So it warns you and allows you to uh, decide what to save. In this way, Git helps us to um, eliminate the probability of, um, or at least decrease it significantly, to overwrite each other's work and to um, make changes that is going to compromise the code and, um, and make sure that we um, don't work on the same thing so that it causes issues because it clashes um, when we save it when we save our latest uh, update of our work. And not, not only that, when we do collaborate using Git and we can do all of these things, we can see who 
uh, saved that version, who uploaded uh, the latest version or this and that version. We can see who made a change. Um, every single change has an author. So if you and I were to collaborate, uh, if I save something, it's going to clearly state that I am the one that saved that version. Uh, if you upload something, it's going to say that you are the author of that version. And it's also going to say when we did that so we can uh, see when uh, what change was made. Again, this might seem arbitrary, but it is really useful when you have a big project and there's a conflict, somebody overwrote something and you can see, you can ask the person directly, hey, you saved this, can you, can you come and take a look at this? Um, it gives us information to help us collaborate more successfully than if it's just a saved version of a file. Uh, so when working with uh, Git, uh, we've already discussed folders and directories, and now we're going to introduce a new word to describe the same thing, uh, repository. So uh, working with Git, you have repositories. Repositories work exactly as folders. There are containers for other folders and files. So when you start up Git, you create a repository, and that is where your code and your files uh, and your folders, directories are going to uh, be stored. So you have this central repository where everything else is contained. And this repository, uh, that is where your hidden Git folder, the hidden Git that you download and initialize, that is where that's going to be as well. So the repository is really like the root folder of your entire project. Now to get into some terminology so you know what people are talking about, um, we can start with the word commit. So commit is what the word we use when we work with version control in Git, um, when we say that, we're, that we've saved something. Uh, it's kind of like a snapshot of what the work looks like in that moment when you commit. Um, in that moment when you upload, save your code and upload it, that is a, a commit that you uh, make. So with these commits, you can have, you add some metadata. Not only do you have an author and a time that gets added automatically, you can even write a message about what you're saving. So say that we're work, working on a website and I want to commit something, I want to save something. Um, I might uh, write a little message so that everyone else in my team knows what I've done. So I might write added um, login and password. Then you know exactly, you, without going into the code, reading it and try, trying to interpret it, you straight away know what the big change was there. And it's also helpful because each commit has an ID. So you can search for it, revert back to it. Um, and uh, if every, uh, it's easier to distinguish between them and search through them and um, use these commits because they have their own individual IDs. Git is also very useful because not only does it let you save uh, your work continuously, um, it lets you do something called branching. Now branching is that um, you take the, the state of your project in one uh, moment in time and you sort of develop it parallelly to somebody else developing on it as well. I'd like to describe it as making a copy of it and developing from that copy. It's not exactly that, but it illustrates sort of the, the whole idea. So you have your project over here and there's people that are working on it and committing and committing uh, on a timeline. And you could start, um, make a branch over here and from the state of the uh, code here, you write your own code over here. So you develop from this starting point, from this origin, your own code over here uh, in parallel to the other people working on the code over here. So they're saving and committing their, the work and you're working on it as well and you have the same origin but it, it develops into two different, um, two different uh, timelines. So then when you're done with something, you can um, take your changes and merge them into the rest of the code that everybody else been, has been developing on or writing code with. 
So say that you, um, from this origin point, uh, added the login and the password, but you haven't changed anything else. Then when you uh, merge your work back into this timeline, you are going to just add the login and the password to the rest of the code that people have developed to that point where it's saved here. So you can just work on one teeny tiny bit. Everyone else works on, on, on the, the main code. And then when you add your code back in, when you merge it, you just add your login feature without changing anything else. And here is where the conflicts can arise. So say that you've been developing something and you only add your login, there are no conflicts. You haven't changed anything else in the code and they haven't done anything to your stuff because you're the one working on it. But if you changed something um, and wrote over or, or wrote different code that is in the same spot as the people over here, then you have one version of that line of code and they have a version of that line of code. They're the computer doesn't know which version of that line of code to save. So that is a conflict then. And by having these branching and merging system, um, we are allowed to choose which version of that line of code to save, to commit and continue on with. If you're working in, in a word processor, it's kind of like a whole take it or leave it. It's either this version or that version. But with this system, you're allowed to make choices for specific places where the code differs. So this is very useful because mistakes happen and um, you don't want to work on one feature and then save over a bunch of other people's work um, when you uh, add your feature to the code. Doing this allows us to sort of have our cake and eat it. You can develop your little piece people can continue developing on other areas of that code. And if you accidentally do something or they accidentally do something wrong, Git says, hey, hey, hold up. Here is a conflict. Which version do you want to keep? And you get to choose and have an overview of what that conflict might be. And the beauty of Git is also that all of this happens automatically. It, it, without the conflicts, it just integrates your changes um, without you having to think about it or do anything special to make it work. And when there are conflicts, it warns you and there are structures in place to make sure that you save the version you want to save. So with all of this, you have the collaboration features, you have um, the safeguards of going back, you have it being on the cloud for free um, if you choose that and you can um, change computer or you can, something could happen and you still have your work saved, you can see without going into the code, what was the changes that were made or added. Um, so it's a very powerful feature that uh, basically all programmers use. This is how we save and share our code. And these cloud uh, providers even uh, have started to and have come quite far actually. Um, in helping us, again, deploy that code that we save. So there are structures in place there to help us take the code that we upload to the cloud and put that, for example, on a server uh, and do that very seamlessly and easily. So it's a very powerful way of collaborating, saving and um, managing your work and your projects. Um, and it might take some time to uh, get used to and some time to uh, understand because when you commit and when you um, merge or when you um, make a branch and things like that, you use certain commands. And sometimes depending on the state of the, of the settings of Git or how it is in default, uh, it could be that you don't understand exactly how it works. So if it's confusing, yes, uh, it is confusing. And um, even seasoned programmers sometimes don't quite understand what's happening or need to some look something up or just don't know what's, how, they don't understand the mechanisms behind what they need to do. They just look up what to do and that's okay. Um, as you work with it more and more, you're going to get more 
familiar with it, used to it, used to the commands, used to the um, understanding how it actually works. But just know that it is not uncommon for seasoned programmers to be like, why, is, why, can't, why isn't this working? Um, I created a branch, I'm just trying to merge what's going on and they need to troubleshoot it. That is completely, completely uh, normal. Um, but stick with it, you're gonna get better at it and the stuff that you don't get better at other people aren't that great at it too, so don't worry about it. Um, but learning Git and learning uh, to use it and um, work with it is going to help you tremendously. And uh, for the benefit of the teachers, I'm going to tell you, and for yourself, I'm going to tell you to, um, it's better to commit too often than to commit too seldom. Because remember what I said, that you can compare commits and the code. So when stuff inevitably goes, goes wrong, if you save your um, work in the beginning of a project and at the end of a project and something goes wrong along the way, you're not going to be able to figure out where the error is. So by committing often, you see your changes in the code step by step. And then if something goes wrong, it's much easier to identify exactly where something did go wrong. Um, and it also, by committing often, you eliminate the probability um, of doing a bunch of work and then something going wrong, your computer crashing and losing all of that work. If you save, uh, sorry, commit once an hour, you lose an hour of work and not two weeks, for example. Um, and by also committing often, you have more um, descriptive commit messages. If you only um, add a text box uh, to your website and that's all you do, and then you can type that into your commit message and just looking at that, you know what was changed in the code. You don't even need to go into it. And if you do that and then you add the login and then you change the layout and then you do this and this and this and this, you're not going to really be able to encapsulate all of that in one single message. And even if you do, it's not at a glance. It's not so simple um, to have an overview of what you've done so far. So try to uh, get into the habit of committing often. Uh, and having descriptive messages and um, um, not being afraid to use this tool and to um, have these incremental changes to your code. Don't think that you need to earn a commit. Um, use it uh, um, very generously. So this was the video for the coders toolkit. Um, might be the most important video of the whole uh, intro course. Uh, might not seem like it now, but here's the thing. This is where a lot of the initial hiccups um, might put some um, might put some uh, struggle in, in might put some um, roadblocks for you. Put up some roadblocks for you because here is where people get confused when they're both learning this and coding. Here is where people maybe get frustrated when they don't know what the difference between the terminal and the shell is. Um, here is where people get frustrated when they don't understand how to navigate a terminal. And here is where they get frustrated when they can't understand or, or don't know how to start working with Git. Um, this is of course, the, none of these things are code, logic, um, soft, creating a piece of software, but they're all as essential as um, a computer <laughs> really um, to the coding process. And if you need to learn all of this and the basics of code at the same time, it's information overload and you get frustrated and uh, can't really differentiate what's what. And you, yeah, you just kind of, feel like, oh, there's so much I need to learn. I don't understand any of it. This is so confusing. Um, and just the, the process of um, downloading it and uh, committing, uh, creating a repository and committing your first, um, making your first commit could be um, a struggle. And then on top of that, when you need to code, you just feel kind of like giving up. Um, 
So having all of these tools um, and understanding them and having them in, in your toolbox before you start coding, it kind of separates the, um, the amount of information that you need to know. And if the, this is the baseline, so this is just sort of should come before uh, coding and, and um, writing algorithms and installing languages and, and what have you. <clears throat> so what I want you to take with you uh, from this video. The terminal is a text-based um, interface that allows you to do everything you do on your computer with your mouse, uh, but instead by typing commands. When you uh, use the terminal, you navigate a tree-like um, folder structure that's always present, but when you're using a mouse, in, a mouse and double-clicking things, you don't see that structure, but it is always there. In order to use the terminal successfully, you need to understand this tree line structure and you need to understand that you go up and down that structure to move uh, in, in and out of folders and to um, access and create and manipulate files. I want you to uh, take with you that um, when you uh, use this, you type in file paths to go somewhere. And if you type in an um, .exe, you um, not only go to where a program is located in your computer, you also run that program. When you type in the location of a file and then that file, you might open that program, but you're not allowed to change anything in that program. And you might need <clears throat> an extra command to go into it and do some changes. I want you to take with you that um, you have a root uh, folder that contains all of your other folders and that this is the structure that you navigate uh, through. I want you to uh, take with you um, permissions that some files you're allowed to read and write and execute, some files you are allowed to read some files you, you're allowed to read, write, execute, and delete. Um, that we have different permissions for different roles. So for example, if I'm a user, I might be able to read and write my own files, but I'm not allowed to uh, even open a system file. And a lot of the time, the one who is allowed to do that is an administrator whose whole job is to make sure that um, people access the things that they're allowed to access and they don't delete or change things that might cause issues for the system. And I want you to remember uh, to take with you version control and what an essential tool it is to save your work, look over your work and collaborate with other people. Um, that is sort of like uh, saving uh, um, a file in a word processor, but much more powerful because you can work on a parallel version um, of your uh, project while other people continue on with the project. And then you can um, combine those changes together. And what an incredible tool that is for programmers. And I also want you to take with you to save or commit often. Uh, it's better to overuse than to underuse to write good messages so that you don't need to go into your code, but you can just look at the message and see what's the chain, what the change is. And lastly, that it's okay if Git commands and how Git works is confusing, um, that it's normal and that uh, seasoned programmers can also have issues with Git and need to figure out what's wrong and look into what's wrong and that things can go wrong sometimes. So remember, these are essential, essential tools. Without knowing how to navigate a file structure, you won't be able to reference files when you start coding. Um, this is the foundation because you might write the best code and logic in the world, but if you can't type in a path to go and ask the computer to get you an image, um, 
you still won't have functioning or effective software. So while this might all seem arbitrary, understand how important uh, being comfortable with uh, the terminal and with the file structures on the computer truly, truly is. So thank you for sticking out this video with me. Um, I hope you learned a lot. That's my other cat saying goodbye to you all by scratching on the scratch board. Um, thank you for watching this video and uh, I hope to see you in the next one.